That's pretty cool. And so yeah, the uh, even the sheet, the sheet. Um, I'll be talking a lot about what that is, but um, that's some of that's going towards just making making this go uh, happen. So cool. cool. Well, well, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here, here, hanging out with you guys, guys, and uh, talking about tending to the life of the soil. It's a uh, it's a pretty cool topic, and uh, for us as farmers in Hawaii, it's been a big deal. Uh, we have a family farm and um, the profitability and just overall success has um, been pretty well changed just by instead of looking at the tree and what the tree is doing, looking at the soil and how that is affecting what the tree is doing. It's um, been massive for us. So I'll jump into that. And uh, it's cool to see that a bunch of you know what natural farming is. And um, I don't know where everybody is. So because of that, this year, maybe next year, we come back and we get into all nitty gritty and the people that don't know what natural farming is are just going to be left behind and have to ask you. But this year, I'm going to play a line somewhere between an introduction to the concepts and um, sharing knowledge to kind of put some tools in your pocket. So I um, grew up on a farm. I was born, uh, my dad was farming when I was born, and um, we farmed pigs and cattle, ranch cattle, and um, you know, eggplant and pineapple and all of it. It was a lot of fun. I'm, I'm grateful for, for that. Um, and somewhere along the line, it fell to me to um, make some decisions and uh, work towards profitability as a farm. And we had, we had a hard time sometimes in farming. Um, and a pretty significant crop failure happened that caused us to look at what the soil life was doing, what our trees were showing us that our extension agent couldn't explain to us. And uh, through a series of really cool opportunities, I had uh, Elaine Ingham come to our town and um, this guy Chohan Yu, um, the kind of iteration of natural farming that's widely shared right now, um, came from him, though this is more of a broad Asian practice, um, traditional uh, farming method. But um, those things happened for us on our farm back in 2008, 2009 and uh, then really got going for us in 2011. And uh, yeah, it's, we're currently um, more profitable than we've been in 30 years as a family farm. And um, it's by and large attributed to a slightly different way of farming. Uh, though the whole business model still looks the same where uh, our bottom line has changed. So that's kind of why I'm here. I farm regeneratively on 700 acres. It's scalable. I live on an island where all inputs and things to bring in are as expensive as it gets. And so we basically produce all our inputs on farm um, at 700 acres. So this is totally doable. We don't, we don't have a huge crew. Right now, my natural farming crew is two people. Um, one and a half. One person's a part-time manager, part-time natural farmer. So. This, for 700 acres, to make everything and apply everything is basically a two-person crew. It's pretty fun. Yeah, so the plant above ground represents the life or, or the health of your system below ground. Um, this is real. This is not a, a theory, and, and I know you guys have heard a lot about that. Um, in the last few days, um, what I'm going to do is, is touch on some of the scientific reasons why, but I think you guys are pretty well, you know, like, okay, yes, I have to tend to the life of the soil, that's why you're here. So I'm also going to talk a little bit of the, the practical avenue to get this done. And um, if you don't know, um, in natural farming, I've taken some time to make some videos. They're on YouTube. Um, you can bump your neighbor or get that, but you can just search my name, Chris Trump, um, and that'll give you a lot of the tools of to how to make some of this stuff, and, uh, and there'll continue to be a bunch more of that. All right, 
So by tending to the soil microbial life, farmers can increase nutrient uptake, uh, suppress disease, and directly affect profitability. Um, I think Elaine talked to you a little bit on Thursday or Friday um, about how much nutrient is in soil. Um, there's tons of nutrients in soil. We currently farm um, nitrogen-wise um, for about not even a hundredth of the recommended nitrogen um, application rate for our crop. So the entire world disagrees with our nu nutrient application amounts per year, our, our entire industry. And we farm at about 25% higher yields than anyone in our state in our industry. It doesn't work, right? And, and so we get a lot of people like, you guys, you know, when we first started, ah, oh, you're crazy. You can't do it like that. That's, nobody does it like that. You know, you, you can't stop applying fertilizer and increase yields, you know. And, um, and we do, we apply a tiny bit of fish fertilizer, liquid fish fertilizer, but now, seven, eight years into us doing this um, farm-wide, they're coming over and they're so, what are you doing? See, we're making more money than them now. And that's a big deal. You know, so now they, we didn't have to say, hey, you should come check out what we're doing. Our trees look better. We're not dealing with the same diseases they're dealing with. And our yields are up by 25% of what they're getting with a pretty significant fertilizer budget. And so this, um, this thing we're going to talk about, I just, I'm here, a little part of why I'm here is to say, yeah, I do this, it works. And if it's a little bit of work to wrap your head around it and get into it and make it your own, it's worth it. So, yeah, don't feel, feel hopeful that uh, even, even though there's a little, been a little bit of, uh, well, you can't do that, you're going to ruin everything. That, like, just so, soil, microbial health. So this is, um, in natural farming, we talk about indigenous microorganisms, IMO. I'll use IMO from now on. Ooh. Can we can we turn the heat down or should I stand on this side? I should stand on this side, away from those. I'm gonna drink. So we talk about IMO. Um, the concepts in natural farming are that we use indigenous microbes. Um, generally because they like our barometric pressure, our rainfall, our temperature. So they're going to thrive, if, especially if you're growing outdoors. There is a dry product, a dormant product, that then I can spread on my land. And I'm basically spread, spreading solid fungal seeds. That's what it looks like under the microscope when I'm done. It's just chocked full of this. That gets on my nice wet surface layer of... Um, you know, leaves, etc. cetera. Um, uh, if you were to think about your intestines, the inside of your intestines as the space around a plant's root, um, that would be a, a decent analogy as far as function. We have a human microbiota, a human biome or gut microbial life kind of colonies that happen that help us get nutrients from the things we put in, from our inputs. Plants are the same way. And uh, it directly affects their profitability, how healthy this zone is. How many of you guys know that a person can get really, really sick if, the, if their human biome breaks down, right? We have all kinds of crazy diseases because people have lost diversity in their gut biome. Um, this is the same thing that we can have happening in plants and we're thinking, I just need to put in better nutrients. They're just deficient in this, this, or this. We start chasing these deficiencies showing up in the leaves when really there's plenty of that in your soil or enough. It just needs to be um, in a healthy living environment able to be taken up. So, so this picture is really to demonstrate the similarity um, between the root zone of a plant and a human. And a lot of what we'll, I'll do today in natural farming is take human analogy, 
um, for plants because it actually helps us because we intuitively understand how you know babies and human beings work um, and we can actually use that because nature's really similar in in mammals and plants um, if we can look at them next to each other all right so I'm gonna get super weird on you for making this analogy um, there's a process known as FMT or fecal matter or microbiota transplant um, so somebody can be totally failing they can be dying literally from a breakdown of microbiota in their gut and um, somewhere along the way I actually met a scientist who read that it says China <laughs> last, last year I was speaking about this and in China there's a international macadamia society uh, research panel and um, he's like I invented that technique and I've never heard anybody speak on it on stage and I was really excited um, very very FMT nerdy guy but, really cool. um, but what's cool about this technique and it's basically you take the diversity of microbiota or human biome kind of gut microbial diversity from a healthy person and either in a pill or in a suppository, you give it to the unhealthy person and they become healthy. The cool thing about that is we don't really know, oops, we don't understand why it works. So we're doing this to human beings with limited knowledge of why it works. The, the, the reality is, is the interconnectivity of the complex diversity of human microbial life or microbial life in the human gut is beyond our ability to currently understand and we've actually embraced that in this technique and saying but it works the person's dying now they're healthy we just need to take the healthy person stuff and put it in the unhealthy person and everything works out i i use this analogy to say to to help us wrap our heads around you don't actually have to understand every single microbe and all its interconnections. A little bust out of the, on, or uh, burning of the um, scientific community as a whole, we don't understand almost anything at all on the interconnectivity of microbial life. We have had a system for many years of isolating a microbe and trying to study it in isolation. And that's effective, we can learn some things. But there is not enough computing power in the entirety of the world to analyze or properly look at the interconnectivity of microbial life in a healthy soil food web in a cubic inch of soil. We don't know how they interact with each other. We, we don't understand that. We are totally ignorant as a worldwide population of scientists. That's okay. We can, however, benefit from the balance that nature establishes on its own, just like FMT. We don't understand why those that specific balance works, or even understand what the balance is. But we can take it from one person Still no and give it to another and no, get good. the results. So that's oh, are we good? kind of what okay. we're doing with indigenous microorganisms. Did you get the Wi-Fi? We're saying I am growing a plant right. here. Back up. And my soil life is not diverse or thriving. So I'm going to go to a forest that hasn't been messed with for a thousand years or a thriving wild ecosystem. So just look for the I'm going to take some of the soil FMT, a farmer's own inoculum, and I'm going to restore or establish great diversity and thriving microbial in my crop I don't have to understand every microbe in that system to benefit from it and help thrive in plants and productive systems. Does that make sense? Okay. Sorry, I apologize for my strange analogy, but uh, it's it's helped um, everybody get on board. All right. So this is a example of um, an earthward analysis of um, some IMO number three from. Actually, this time last year um, on our farm and um, what I'm going for here is again a dry product I end up so this is a, a dormant or a low moisture
texture product um, where I've taken indigenous microbes from a local area, grown it out on the media, and gotten an extremely high fungal to bacterial ratio um, so that I can just spread all those fungal spores out on my cropland or spray them out in tea form and uh, benefit from that inoculum. I get disease resistance and get bug suppressing um, uh, qualities from this diversity of nature. Because how many of you guys know that many, many bugs have a fungal predator? You know, the, a lot of a lot of things and you know these these expensive treatments that we can get from our our local uh, Favaria Bassiana salesmen actually are already in our soil and we can get them established in such a way that we're actually getting natural disease resistance just by having the diversity present. Now, do we totally have perfect data for all of this? You know, no. We know it works. We know that it exists in nature, but we can be okay with not isolating every strain of microbial life that we're applying. We can benefit because it's already working in uh, a natural environment, growing trees that are healthy, we're identifying them. So, um, so I'm going for my farm because of trees, and really for your, farm, for your farms as well, um, cannabis um, loves a higher fungal bacterial ratio. It's not like um, lettuce or something like that, or, or closer to a shrub or a tree. And so you're anywhere from 20 to 30 to 1 of fungal to bacterial ratio that your plant likes. And I know you've heard this a lot this weekend, but I just want to encourage you, understanding where you are in fungal to bacterial ratio in your growing media or your, your root zone is super important. You think all nutrients, and I want to get the right nutrients, I want to get the right nutrients. If your plant is in a 1 to 1 fungal to bacterial soil, you're going to have a deficiency of nutrients. Even if you spent all the money on all the best things, you're going to have a deficiency in uptake. And, and that's all, it can be almost free resolving that. So I just really want to say it again, I know you've already heard, but um, understanding fungal to bacterial ratio, if you leave with something you didn't have before, pursuing, wrapping your head, going down the rabbit trail of that, strongly encourage that. So, um, you have um, disease suppressing fungi and um, all kinds of cool things. So I'm looking for my total fungi because this is dormant. Um, this is um, not the same as active fungi. Remember, this is a dry material. So what those are is those really cool circular fungal spores like we had in um, this, this thing here. So these guys will sit in a dry environment just waiting for you to reintroduce water and they'll all wake up and create hypha and go to town breaking down your nutrients and making a plant available. And then, yeah, total fungi, total bacteria. Here's another one. Um, you have disease um, suppressing fungi, um, which is awesome. So, so many times I see these deficiencies um, that people are posting, and it's like, yes, you can do a foliar micronutrient and probably get a correction there. But if you understood tending to the microbial life of your soil and getting balance or, or the right ratio of fungi to bacteria, you probably wouldn't have that issue in the first place. And so, do you want to chase the deficiency or do you want to? And we switched. So, um, on our farm, we've taken. Uh, soil and um, tissue culture or tissue tests for you know 20 years and um, with our soil analysis we'd have these pH problems and they'd be like you know two tons of lime per acre you know for the growing season you, know, you, get, you go by the lime and apply it and then we'd have the same prescription for 10 years running I'm like, I, I don't think we're correcting the problem you know, our, our, it's, we're going to, and now since we've switched to tending the microbial life of the soil, um, we actually have never had a pH problem. Our pH is perfect for a crop. It's, it's a funny thing. We never apply lime anymore. So, um, 
yeah, just the encouragement to um, think of this as a uh, living system and tending to that properly and, and not really having to chase as much in the microbial or micronutrient. So we, as we made this change on Son of Art's orchard, we did about half at the start. We had 360 or 400 conventional, 360 uh, organic and um, so even, this was good. Right, thank you. we would submit our uh, soil and tissue co uh, to the analyst and initially before we started we had these um, soil deficiencies that showed up in the tissue and he's like oh you got to do this much da, da, da. and then as we changed and started tending the microbial life of the soil we'd submit the tissue and the soil and you'd be like, wow, you have all these deficiencies in your soil, but I'm not seeing any of them in the tissue. I'm not seeing any of them in your leaves. Your leaves are perfect. And so we had to explain to them, we, we are, this is what we're doing. We're thinking we're getting better nutrient uptake, et cetera. And so the next year when we submitted our uh, soil and tissue, he put an asterisk, a little star. He said, unless there's high quantity of microbial life present. So we had a recommendation or for on our soil analysis, like, oh, this is what you're gonna need unless there's high microbial life present. Because he couldn't understand, he didn't know what he was looking at. He didn't understand what was happening on the farm. <laughs> he couldn't make a recommendation with his scientific knowledge because he's not seen any of the deficiencies in our leaves. Does that make sense? So all of a sudden, that whole testing system was broken for us. And no, it's no longer a, our soil nutrient analysis is no longer a good representation of our uptake or what's available to our trees. Because our trees have microbial relationships in their root zones. And so they're getting all these nutrients that aren't even showing up on the soil analysis. Does that make sense? You guys are with me. Cool. So um, I stand here to tell you that it's commercially viable and scalable. Um, to, to tend to the microbial life in the soil using this free and natural farming. Um, and let me say this, because you guys know me as somebody that shares free and natural farming. I don't believe it's the only way to tend to the microbial life of the soil. I love Elaine Ingham's information. She taught me um, fungal bacteria ratio. I didn't understand that when I started, and I was working hard to try and tend to the microbial life in the trees, and I had an experiment gone wrong where I applied something somebody else made and like five acres of trees yellowed overnight. And I was like, what did I do? And she came to town that next week and I took a week long class with her. She taught me the microscope. I bought a microscope. I go and look at this stuff I applied. It's all bacterial. I grow trees. My trees are like a thousand to one or 30 to a thousand to one fungal. And I applied something that imbalanced them bacterially and they were telling me they're not happy. And so that was huge for me. And so, so you know, that I'm just saying you can take those principles, and this is an elegant method to apply it. Um, there's methods all over the world that are super cool and have been passed down by farmers for generations. And uh, I believe farmers were some of the best scientists before we had universities, because science is the observation, is the study of nature through observation and experimentation. And who's better at observing the crops than farmers, right? And who's better at doing experiments than farmers because they never want to do an experiment that failed next year, right? So the things they passed down weren't like, oh, you know, like the community didn't go, oh yeah, that farmer, his crops always die and he's trying to sell us this method he's using. You know, they, they wouldn't use that again. They wouldn't teach his son that thing, you know? So. If we have some this this thousand year old practice of tending to the microbial life of the soil, and now we're seeing it lines up beautifully with what we understand of science, we can say, oh yeah, they were doing using science even before they had a microscope because they were observing and experimenting and taking what worked. Because a farmer is basing their livelihood on what works or doesn't, so they're gonna they're gonna keep doing the things that work and they're gonna quickly cut out the things that don't work, right? So, natural farming is just an elegant method. It's something I found it helped me apply these principles quickly and efficiently on a large scale. Um, one of my favorite things about all of this and about this whole conference is 
we are gaining tools to understand and partner with natural law. Your understanding based on scientific realities, all of a sudden you can observe something and make judgments, analysis with, with pretty good information. And so your hypothesis became educated guesses and you can make decisions or, or movements as a farmer that are actually gonna help you because you have understanding. You're not just, I have no idea what's going on here. See, when, you, when you're doing things from a chemical standpoint, you actually have no concept of the flow of nutrients. You're just, you're just giving nutrients. And, and so as we step into, oh, there's relationships here and this is how nutrients are taken up. All of a sudden you have, oh, my water is causing the aerobic fungi, my overwatering is causing the aerobic fungi to have no oxygen, and so I'm getting imbalanced bacterially, and I have these deficiencies, and you're seeing things. That's my favorite part, is that you as a farmer, through this knowledge, can gain tools to make analysis and educated guesses to um, increase your profitability and production. So, observation becomes a very important tool for a farmer. Um, this is a, a study done by University of Hawaii Manoa um, by Kun Hui Wang, um, a friend of mine, and uh, I want to cruise through this real quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time here um, just because I think you've had a lot of cool science and I want to talk a little bit more of application. But um, this one's neat. They did a, um, this is telling about it, but this is a little easier to differentiate. Um, they did um, eight kind of side-by-side -side rows with corn. They did a standard grower practice, which is like a conventional grower practice. So fertilizers plus a work weekly horticultural micronutrient mix. So 100% fertilizer. Um, they did a control, no treatment at all. They did IMO number four, which is just a stages of growing it out. Um, and then a, a foliar nutrient spray, which is very light, um, very little, um, almost homeopathic. And then you have EM um, with 50% of the standard grower fertilizer. So bringing in um, uh, organic fertilizers and 50% and, uh, of a standard rate, two applications, they did it kind of continually, and then Sumigro, Mycos. So these are all plant-based um, inoculums you can get plus fertilizer. And uh, they did these all side by side. Corn height, IMO, Mycos, and standard were pretty similar. IMOs here, but being a little taller five weeks after planting. Um, total fruit weight, IMO beat everything. Um, by not by a whole lot though, standard growing practice and 50% fertilizer EM was close. This um, study was funded by EM, uh, an EM company, and they were able, they were allowed to take it down because they didn't like the results. So it's not on the internet, but I have it. And so does um, so does University of Hawaii Manoa. Um, total plant biomass. Standard grower practice was slightly higher. Um, IMO and these were all pretty comparable. Um, fruit weight. Um, few of these produced comparable uh, yields as the standard grower practice. Um, similar, um, slightly higher fruit counts as the uh, standard grower practice in IMO and, and uh, some of the other things. However, it was noteworthy that the microorganism treatment did comparably well with only one to two applications up front versus the standard practice, which included 100% conventional fertilizers and weekly micronutrient foliar, foliar applications. So um, here's the part that I have a little bit of issue with is that this is a really cool study and we see some needed results, but we don't see the costs of those comparably. Now all those, the, I know because I know what it costs to buy um, some of these things, but these, this is 
way more expensive than this. And these all, you're, you're buying um, off the shelf retail products. And I'm sorry for retail product sellers. I'm not, I'm not against that in any way. I'm just saying when, we, when you guys start having to sharpen your pencil and look at your bottom line, knowing with the research what the costs are and how to, to balance that is going to be valuable information. So I guess I just a little bit of a push for research that does bring into consideration the cost for a farmer. And so what I take away from this is, wow, for you know one cent on the dollar, I can get comparable yields. I don't even care if they're the same yields or slightly lower. If I'm making about 100% more per pound, you know, or, or you know, whatever, 50% more per pound, that's a big deal. And uh, so, for your information, um, so this is um, our nut farm, and we use 100% of these natural farming practices. And our costs are compar comparable to conventional um, because we have we have to mow now or conventional just sprays roundup torches their whole um, floor and then our yields are a little higher than conventional um, this is one of the um, fathers if you will of natural farming um, and he said the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. And I think as you guys uh, look at all of this, what you're doing, what you're taking in, what you're affecting in your environment and how you feel about it also matters, that has a value. So I, I'm just, uh, you're on the right track in uh, hanging out here. Definitely further research needed. I love research. I am I'm pretty, pretty nerdy when it comes to uh, doing trials and analysis. So if you have somebody that wants help with uh, natural farming research, we can call. I'd love to be involved. And so feel free also to contact me. I have to take off today. Um, this particular trip was kind of tight for me. Um, so I'm not going to hang out uh, all night to answer questions. I'm sorry about that. But feel free. Um, hit me up and ask me anything. Um, like Suzanne, you know, how many guys have had responses from me on the internet via Instagram or stuff? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll answer eventually. So, uh, all right, I'm going to show you now. We're going to jump into a little bit of the application. All right, so. In natural farming, in natural farming, we are um, there's some theory involved in applying um, nutrients that I found to be really effective. And so, um, the theory is the right amount at the right time. So the, the the power becomes in the hands of the farmer in observation. So it's not front load all your nutrients in the beginning um, as much as it is that a plant, like a human being, goes through stages of life where it needs different um, nutritional, it has different nutritional needs. This is kind of out of order because I need to explain this, but um, the toolkit Simplified, and that's kind of what the sheet is that Josh was holding up. Um, it's basically what I wish I would have had when I started natural farming, something to kind of keep me on track, help me remember all these kind of um, recipes. Um, and even with the dry erase marker, being able to check off when I'm making things. But um, we have a, a baby food or a, a maintenance type spray. Um, we have a type two. Um, I'll, I'll show what all these are in a minute. Um, food for rapid growth, so that's your, your veg. There's changeover food for that, that period of time where a plant kind of shifts its nutrient needs. Um, and then stuff to help it deal with all that stored nitrogen and produce the structure necessary for good production. And then liquid IMO is something that um, kind of my contribution um, in a way to natural 
it's a slightly different recipe that came out of Korea. All right, so you and I are one is part of this philosophy of natural farming. Um, to use human life cycle as analogous to plant life cycles, to help us wrap our heads around the concept that a plant doesn't need its midlife food when it's a seedling. Um, so um, we have an infancy in, in humans, and we understand that a uh, baby, when it's born, needs colostrum and then milk, you know, these very small amounts of food. We instinctually know that we never want to give our three day old infant steak. You know, we, we just, we know that. We, we're never going to do that. It's intuitive, right? However, we'll take a new seedling and put it in extremely dense, nutrient rich soil. You know, or, or you know, we'll, we'll transplant into something where we're trying to get all the soil there or ahead of time, all the nutrients. And um, I would venture to say you're actually limiting your plant's total poten potential um, by not letting it struggle with a small amount of nutrients at a young age, um, where it's going to be that much better at taking up nutrients when it really needs it. So concept as it relates to children. We have a rapid growth stage, so we have this, this infant stage like him. If I give him a, a four course meal, you know, at one or however old he is, um, this, this is my son Logan, and uh, he, he would, it wouldn't be quite right for him if I tried to make him eat my portions, right? I'm different. Um, we know that, but do we do that? To, do we apply that to plants? I would say wrongly we don't. We we try, and, and so this is the concept that we can take the concept of different nutritional needs in its life cycle, as we already intuitively understand it in humans, and think about it as it relates to plants. So, um, in a human being, we go through an infancy. We go through a young child. Where we're starting to get more nutrients and then we get into the next stage where this guy you know basically as much as i can push into him food wise he's going to stay beanpole skinny and burn it all off because he's just growing like crazy making structure right he can't eat too much you can't put a 10 year old on a diet because they are every bit of food you give them see your plants go through this and vegetative growth like if, if they have all their food, they just do really well. And if they have proper microbial connections, they're going to take everything they need and they're going to thrive. And you can't really overfeed them. <coughs> but this guy, I could, I could overfeed. I could do the wrong, you know, he's, he's going to get, you know, but even at his age, he's actually almost past the place of overfeeding them. It's the infant, you know, that you don't want to feed steak to. So, I know that's kind of like, well, why is he talking about human beings and plants? I just don't really understand. Um, it's, it's kind of a strange analogy. But I have found, um, by doing it over the last 10 years, that I actually get better yields if I let my seedlings struggle with a low nutrient than if I give them a ton of nutrients to start. I'm talking better yields like a month later. Why? Well, it's because I'm training a plant to eat for its life. I'm training a plant, and so with low nutrient needs in the beginning of its life, it actually like, I need to work on these roots, and I need to make relationships, and it starts pushing for nutritional uptake in the early stage, rather than saying, oh, everything I need is here, and get fat and lazy, right? <laughs> And, and so all of a sudden, when it is time to like grow, it, it focused on roots and, and et cetera, and um, nutrient uptake in its early age. And now when it's time to jam and eat and grow like crazy, it's actually doing that better than if I had fed it like crazy from a young age. These are, this is kind of the concept. So for example, there's seed soak, which is a very light nutritional um, thing and this is pictures I'm using of Wendy's by permission. She had um, she used seed soap rather than just water, and she had 100% germination 
in about 10 hours so much, so quickly, she wasn't ready for it. And, um, and then those, um, even just with, with uh, SES, she has um, somehow the, the seeds are showing a little bit better um, uh, health at several weeks old than stuff with folic acid and, you know, random, a bunch of extra food. So this lesser food, then adding a bunch of things, she's actually seen better results. I'm, this this is applied to everything, though. I'm seeing this everywhere. So for this is just a for example. So what do you mean? Um, so there's also this concept that every plant goes through different stages, stages of skinniness, stages of fatness. You go back to, you know, these guys, he's round. And how many guys know the kids, they get a little round and then they shoot up. And then they get round and then they shoot up, right? You've seen that little, little pudgy and then you see them next year and they're like two feet taller and bean pole. You know, it's, it's what happens with kids. Like this guy looked like this, you know, he, he, but now he's like all, all bones and knees and stuff. You know, this, so these are different, they have different nutritional needs. This guy needs, you know, his calcium to help produce structure to grow and process all this stored energy and fat. This guy probably just needs as much fat as I can put in, right? He needs high energy, etc. So plants are the same way. These plants all are showing us and telling us different things. Your plants do the same. So we'll do a little game. So let's say we have vegetative, which is high nitrogen uh, food. This is foods in uh, natural farming. It's really light um, targeted foods for the right amount of nutrients at the right time. So we have vegetative growth, which is type two. We have changeover, which is to help a plant go from vegetative growth to fruit production. And then we have um, type three, which has more calcium, helps it produce, um, work with some of its stored nitrogen and uh, produce structure and, and grow so that it can produce more crop. Um, so what is this plant telling us it needs? This is kind of a trick question, but I just explained to you, but what is it kind of saying? What, where, what kid would you say that looks like? Short and fat, right? It's kind of round, kind of looks like he has a lot of nitrogen, but maybe maybe it could use something else. So this one would need type three. We would apply some calcium here. We would give it the the amount, the nutrient it needs. It doesn't need more nitrogen right now, right? That plant's not saying, give me more nitrogen. It's saying, hey, I'm I might need something to balance some of my nitrogen. Maybe somebody loaded me up with a ton of fertilizer here, right? You, you with me? Kind of see that? All right. So what is this plant telling us? It's kind of hard to see. It's it's from far away, but yeah, it's it's just beginning to have little um, nodes show up um, here. So it, it's getting ready, getting ready to fruit, and so it's it's going to shift its nutrient needs um, right now. So we do changeover. And then what is this plant telling us? It needs, probably needs a little food, right? It's like, hey, I'm hungry. So we would give it type two with some, with some nitrogen mixing it. So the reason I showed this, I know this isn't your, your crop, but the reason I showed this, and maybe I should, I'll get some crop pictures. I'll get some canvas pictures next time, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> The, the reason that I showed this is, do you see how you as the farmer actually, if you have the tool, the nutrient tool in your pocket that can be taken, it's really microdized nutrients, so they're easily taken up to foliarly or with soil drenched. Do you see how you all of a sudden have a tool to feed them the right amount of nutrient at the right time? You can take a plant and instead of, you'll actually get higher yields with less costs in reality. I'm not talking about lessening your yields because you're not, using the right nutrients or yeah, the right amount of nutrients. I'm talking about pushing on yields because the plant gets everything it needs when it needs it. Um, so these are the recipes again. Um, so here's kind of the base. All of these have this. So it's a brown rice vinegar, an OHN, and a fermented plant juice. And uh, they're used in very small quantities. 
And then you add in, on top of that recipe, you add in a fish amino acid, so this is your high nitrogen, um, or you add in a calcium phosphate, so your phosphorus comes in for changeover, or you add a um, calcium, uh, highly micronized plant available calcium um, for that fat plant. So that, that one guy who did the calcium, that guy who did the changeover, that guy who did the nitrogen. And the plants go through um, stages of needing different ones of these throughout. So you might have a plant that's in production, but maybe it starts needing a little nitrogen. You can bring in, bring back in the nitrogen at that time, um, even though it's gone into flower. But you can do it through soil drainage, so you're not spraying on the foliar. Um, so this is the same thing. This is kind of what the sheep has, and. Natural farming is a bit of a radical, so I teach a five-day intensive class. I'll be doing one in Boise in August. It's on my website, naturalfarming.co. I also teach this, applying this stuff in like a 45-minute class online that you can just watch online, and I send you some documents that go with it. Because it's it's a technique. It's it's an art. It's learning how to do something um, that's skill-based. Yeah. Chris, your, your examples are always so beautiful. And when I share my, my, my preparations with folks, and I tell them mix at a thousand to one, you're like, shut up, that's not right. gonna do anything. How do you explain to people how such a small amount can have such a big impact? I show them that I have 25% higher yields than them. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to convince people these things. They're like, I've never, nobody does it like that. You can't be right. Okay. <laughs> but you bring them to your farm and you show them. They say, hey, my fertilizer costs me like one tenth of what yours are. Wow, your plants look way better than mine. Yeah, you want to not like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's much easier to sell. Yeah. So showing people is, is the best way I found to do it. But explaining to them is hard. Um, but if they're up for kind of like checking their, you know, their extension agent knowledge at the door, you can say, you know, look at how nature does it. You know, microbes live on the leaf surface and they can actually process gas nitrogen into plant available nitrogen. The air can actually feed your plants if you have the right microbial life on your foliage. You know, it, the, the rainfall that's full of nitrogen, it drips off the plants into the um, drip, um, circle, drip layer, drip line. Drip line, thank you. Um, drips into the drip line where all the feeder roots are, you know, like, this is how nature fertilizes, you know, and there's all kinds of nitrogen in the soil. It's, it's difficult, it's that, that's a great question. How do you convince people that you can farm a different way? Well, the example that I use is that I just talk this like homeopathic medicine kind of, like a little bit, turns on systems, and I don't know if that's legit or not, but people go, oh yeah, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, commercial farmers are going to be like, homeopathic, yeah, <laughs> thanks man. Yeah. I'm not going to put my livelihood on your, you know, boo-boo, yada, 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 stuff. <laughs> It's hard. It's, it's, that's a great question. It's hard. How do you convince others to give this a try? And, um, you know, it, it was, I had a lot of kind of pushback in our industry, a lot, in my family of, you know, farming together, we had pushback. And, uh, and finally everybody was like, oh no, we're doing this. <laughs> right? You know, like, and then my, my peers in the industry are like, will you come to China and speak to our international research? Will you be on our research? board and you know these things are you know from them looking the the head of the international macadamia society came to our farm and he's like i don't see trees like this anywhere you know we you know i i want to hear what you have to say about it. and so the best way to do it is show them. And, and so um in humboldt i had a few of the farmers get up eddie has is from he came to our class and um He's profitable with this. He has a pretty big grow. Josh, how many acres does, how much area does Eddie farm? Um, he's Josh stepped out, but it's, you know, guys are using this on cannabis. Wendy's using this on cannabis and getting yields, you know, real yields. Um, and their fertilizer costs are going down. So
So, anyways, it's, it's a great question. Hard to explain. Um, or hard to convince people without just showing them. But yeah, I'll, I'd love to take more questions. I have a little bit of time left to take questions, I think. So, ask away. <laughs> Can I buy your nuts? <laughs> <laughs> Mow one of the trees that you have to mow. Yep, I mow. Um, what if you just left? What is there? Is there uh, the grass would grow five, six feet high, and we mechanically harvest off the ground. <laughs> um, you know those things that pick up golf balls in the driving range? Some of our harvesters look like that, and so we need to keep it kind of turf light. Yeah. yeah, and you can, it, the, we sell the processors our nuts right now. One of our processors is. Um, making an organic package on my Instagram, it, it shows them. We don't really get paid when they sell things though. We get paid as a farmer, so we get a, a bulk, unprocessed rate, so you're not helping our farm. But, but they're incredibly tasty, you can ask me. Brown rice vinegar, so vinegar helps to micronize your water particles. It actually helps for the whole solution to be Micronized or easily taken up. It actually has a, a bunch of cool properties. And OHN, um, I actually sell it on the website because it's a three month process to make. But I teach you how to make it on YouTube. It's really doable, it's not hard, it's just kind of a tedious. So people are like, I want to start tomorrow. And I'm like, well, no, it takes three months to get started. So I do, I didn't make that, and you can buy it um, just until you get yours going. Yeah. Yeah, making uh, an IMO collection, I had three, well, two field attempts before I actually got it right last summer, but I tried late in the season and sent you some pictures, and I had a lot of molds in the culture. When's the best time of the year? Because come September, we're 85, 90% humidity, 40 degrees. So when's the best time of the year to do an IMO collection? So this question is, when is the best time of year to collect IMO? That's the IMO one. So that's you getting that initial inoculum out of the forest. And I totally, I, as a farmer, this is the cool part about IMO too. I, I always say when people are like, well, Elaine or Cho, you know, natural farming or soil food, I don't know. We can take all this information and benefit from it as farmers. And so if Elaine had IMO too on her show, she would benefit it if these Koreans, Cho uh, Hong Yu had uh, the understanding of uh, fungal bacterial ratios, they would have been super helped. So we can learn from all of this. It's a good time to be alive and understand the microbial life in the soil. But um, ideally, as a farmer, I would have an inoculum from each season over a three year period on my shelf. So I'd have a spring, summer, fall. Maybe I can't harvest in winter, it's difficult. Um, over three years, and they're all shelf stable. And then when I go to make some of this material, I just have a scoop from each one, and I have diversity over, you know, rain season, dry season, all these different microbes that thrive or diminish depending on the season are all inoculated. And um, so that's ideal. But maybe you have three, maybe you have spring, summer, fall over a couple of years. Um, but they do keep for several years. So now instead of me having to run out and grab material to inoculate my um, compost each time, I have them on my shelf, they're stored inside and kept safe because those are really valuable to me. So yeah, every time is a good time to collect it, but you do have to vary sometimes if it's like, we've had a good collection at 105 degrees in the desert in Idaho this last summer, and uh, I had to make a little wet of rice so that it wouldn't dry out before the collection got to bloom and everything that happened. Good question. Actually, there's an out on here. I think the out is just a cat. You're talking about the different inputs. Yeah, so there are um, things that are vinegar based. Um, WCA, WCAP, it's pretty much infinite. OHN, it only gets better with age. Um, FPJs, I usually figure about six months before they start to change, maybe not in a positive way if I'm stored in a cool, dark place. But if you do have really nice storage, kind of like on concrete, cool, dark, you know, not super hot, definitely out of direct sunlight, they can keep a lot longer FPJs. Can. 
Um, LAB, LAB is something store in the fridge or some people saturate with sugar. I would say three months is max with LAB before you start to really have a fall off of quality. Just make it pretty periodically. Um, what am I missing? FAA gets better with age. Um, that doesn't have a shelf life. Um, yeah. Totally. Are there certain, uh, certain components that should be What do you mean, Steve? Oh, nothing. Go ahead. Oh, I was going right. to ask a question. Are there other components that should be refrigerated besides the LED? Besides the LED? No, you don't have to refrigerate. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to. You can refrigerate LAB. I wouldn't refrigerate. You don't really need to refrigerate other things. I'm going to run a random video in the background. We have just a few more minutes before we have to pick it up. I got a but, um, question. This will just be fun to watch some other streams we put on our farm. I'll stand by to show you. Why? So this is a spring. Oop. We had a question on from the online. They asked, "What is SW and what is FPJ?" What? Okay, so SW. How do I make this play? SW is seawater. Did I go to like a different screen? Oh yeah, I did. So SW is ocean water, which. I'll explain right now. There we go. This is a strain liquid I am on the farm. Um, it's a lot of fun. So SW seawater plants have a salinity in their blood, so to speak, of about a 1 to 30 dilution of seawater. So when we take seawater and dilute it 1 to 30, we're basically treating plants with their cytoplasm, if you will. Um, we have the same thing in our blood. We have basically seawater too, right? So using some seawater is a great way to get some minor minerals, etc. And then what was the other one? S seawater and what? Uh, FPJ. FPJ, fermented plant juice. I have a video on it. You can check it out on YouTube. Um, just search Chris Trump FPJ and uh, it'll take you on the whole process on how to do it. And uh, it's a great plant food basically is what you're getting from that. It's a good plant and you have beneficial biochemicals that exist there too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. <coughs> Repeat how question. How do you choose a plant for FPJ? Is, is what he's asking. Yeah, and um, that's great question. So, what I look for is health. So, um, if a plant is always crazy healthy, always grows like crazy, and the bugs never mess with it, it's doing a really good job with taking up nutrients and making relationships in that soil and that environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm looking not so much for, I know people are like, well, that really cool plant that has all these things we know about. What about the things we don't know about, you know? So I'm looking, we, we actually know I'm sorry, I keep knocking what we know, but we know very little about a lot of these things. We're trying to understand how beneficial biochemicals interact when we apply them to our plants, but we are just beginning to understand that. It's cutting edge research that is still in the experimental stage. But if I take, we use kelp. Why do we use kelp? Because kelp grows like crazy. It never gets sick. It's always going nuts, right? It's, it's, it has some of the best biochemicals in nature as far as plant growth hormone. A lot of the plants in your environment that you are literally blind to, this is the thing, you gotta turn, you gotta put your goggles back on of, I am looking for things that are healthy because all the things that are the best for FPJ, you're literally blind to because you see them every day and you come to ignore them. They're your, your ivy or your ice plant or your um, sour grass or whatever, all these random things that grow everywhere and no one ever has to take care of them they're always thriving and always beautiful and lush and the bugs never mess with them. You know, those are the good things to choose for FPJ. Yeah, pondweeds can work. You had a question there? How long exposure would you recommend for pondweeds? Like how long exposure should you recommend? Am I talking? I'm going to be quiet. This is our lab. No, it's still talking.
Is that showing up in your feed? I'll turn it off. Okay. Sorry, I asked your question again. Yeah, so same way you apply to anything. Um, you're going to have to choose your application method. How would I apply to row crops was this question. Application method is something you're going to have to decide for yourself. You can apply IMO4 at 330 pounds per quarter acre. I have a video on showing how to apply IMO4. You saw the video of me throwing out with a compost thrower. Um, that's how you apply a so solid IMO. Or you could do it foliarly with a liquid IMO. Yeah. You said you only have two 
uh, people working on your farm? Did your labor go down as well? No, no, our labor increased a little bit. Okay. Um, we were able to hire more. Mm -hmm. Right. But for all for all the cost to make to buy the inputs to um, apply them. <coughs> We spray three times a year our nutrients and we do some composting. We make uh, some compost from our byproducts. Um, our costs are about $27 per acre per year to apply <coughs> natural farming inputs. So, and this, what does that this, compare to other conventional farmers in your area? So, uh, comparable. <coughs> comparable to a conventional cost, um, but maybe a little less. So, <laughs> lactic acid bacteria in the cannabis online world is the um, central point of natural farming. In actual natural farming, it has this tiny little long side. It's really not a main player. Uh, when you make IMO, lactic acid bacteria and all kinds of other species of bacteria are so easy and they're in the right balance. Um, it does have, it has a ton of uses, and it's really great in nature, and it makes up 70% of our gut microbial um, community, so um, it's really important, um, but it really is only used more in the finishing or towards the um, kind of ripening of your plant. Um, so you'd use it maybe as a soil drench with seawater um, towards the end of your plant to help it really finish off with those good flavors and get those kind of fish about um, and then um, yeah. <clears throat> um, the seawater in Hawaii yeah. is pretty available. Where would So if you don't have, if you're landlocked and you don't have access to seawater, get some cheap, um, just, they, you can find places where you get agricultural sea salt, basically. So don't go to the store and buy the little packet of sea salt for you know ten dollars and try and make that work go find some you know 30 pound bag that they'll sell you of sea salt from korea or somewhere and um and then put it one 30 t uh 30 grams per liter gives you seawater and then one gram per liter gives you a one to 30 dilution which is good for application so that's how you apply sea salt to water to get seawater yeah. You're still farming animals, and is there a role for animals in this? Totally a role for animals in this. Um, I farm a tiny bit of chickens right now in Boise, Idaho. We farm 200 uh, hair sheep in Hawaii, which is a hobby for us. Um, but um, treating uh, grassland is incredibly effective in with natural farming. How am I doing on time, Josh? Is he not here? Oh, I still got a little bit. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, <clears throat> chicken farming and Korean natural farming is really the jewel of natural farming. There's so many cool things, but a lot of chicken farming, pig farming, cow farming, um, it's really focused on, or a huge part of it is IMO4 in their food and IMO4 in their living environment and their soils to deal with food. food. So pigs, you never, there's no smell of piggeries and you never have to change the litter. They'll literally, their poop will get turned into white vitamin crackers and they'll dig for it and eat it and be the better for it. You won't have any diseases. Um, it's, it's really incredible. And chicken's the same way. I have a chicken coop that I've run for a year at our new place in Boise and uh, we've never cleaned out chicken coop. Um, and uh, we won't ever have to. It's just the microbes break it down. They dig in it. They eat in their leaf in their litter, and uh, it's it's full of bugs and stuff. I don't have a YouTube video on chickens. I will by summertime. I, I have all the footage and stuff. I've just not put it together. Um, yeah. So what do you use yeah. for your chicken cook litter? Say that again. What do you use for your litter? Uh, wood chips and I am all for. Uh, some biochar if you can get it, and a little bit of sea salt. I do have a video on how to make the, the floor for a chicken coop that's on my YouTube. And the floor for a piggery. 
FAA is fish amino acids. There's a video on how to make it. It's basically getting fish waste for free, adding some sugar to it, and leaving it sit for six months, and you basically have a taste of fish sauce, but it is a highly micronized nitrogen source for this really plant available. Yeah. I was curious about, like, assuming you the I am all bad. I was listening to me talking again. I'm going to stop this, guys. Um, this is our nut processing facilities where we husk them and we use all our byproducts. Oops, I skipped. Worm bins have great microbial life and 
worms knocked out E. coli with their bodies and, and stuff. And it's all good, but it doesn't have the diversity of a thousand year old forest. You with me? So that's, you want to collect somewhere if you can go and find something undisturbed. You know, what if that's 10 miles from my place? Or what if it's a 30 minute drive? If it's generally the same microclimate, I'm okay with that. If it's too far away? It, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, it, I, I could, but I know that getting a totally different climate, you're, you're gonna, it, it's, it's not gonna have the same, and you you want to make IMO3 to IMO4 with your local soil so that you're introducing them to the, um, your soils, um, microarthropods and nematodes and all that good stuff. So. How much um, soil are you supposed to collect and are you supposed to dig down a little to get to the root your stuff or does it matter? For IMO4 to yeah. bring in that soil? Yeah. yeah um, you just, you're, you want as much soil as um, IMO3 you have. So equal by mass. So more by weight than by volume. IMO3 will often be light and fluffy. <laughs> And so you're going to use a little less soil if you look at the piles next to each other. And then um, if you can, you collect it from a couple places in your farmland. And if you can get some red soil, some of that um, iron rich, you know, if you have red soil in your area, that's great too. Yeah, so 25% iron, uh, red soil, 25%, you know, farm or your area soil, and then 50% iron oil three is the idea for that. <laughs> I know like people who live in the city and like people who live in the country are kind of like, in Michigan, everything's basically at one point been cut down and devastated by human beings, right? And so say like I live in Ann Arbor, there's like a state park like 30 miles west. Is that probably where you would go? Or would you go like, or like for somewhere like Detroit, that almost might be like one of the closest places that they could find some untapped. And that's yeah. like an hour away. That's, would you that's go probably okay. Because you're still getting the same kind of winter cycle, you're still getting a similar rainfall, you know. Um, yeah, and but I would also get something closer that maybe isn't as diverse or long. So I would have a little bit from each, mingle them all when you make your IMO3. What about like, like abandoned alleyways that you've know been back for like 10 years? I'm serious. <laughs> you, you can do whatever you want. Ultimately, you're king of your farm, you gotta make good choices uh, as, as best you can. Well, yeah, yeah, dude, but if you're in a warehouse downtown Detroit, and, like, you're trying to gather local indigenous microorganisms, I'm not, it's not a joke. No, no, I, I wasn't thinking it was a joke. I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. You, I, I can't answer all that, is I guess what I'm saying. You, you're going to have, if you're thinking, wow, there's some thriving plant life here, I'm going to collect here. Uh, what I would say, though, is if you do that alleyway, make sure you have some from that park, too. You know, don't. Don't just do the alleyway IMO2 to IMO3. Try and get a few places, even if that park's an hour away and maybe it's too far, you're still gonna get a much better diversity from that. I mean, 100 to one diversity wise. And even though maybe that isn't all perfect for your environment, you're still gonna get a lot from that. So I, I would probably lean personally to the park and the alleyway um, for the sake of diversity. But I hear you, you gotta do, you, you literally can do that though. You can farm with the stuff you get anywhere. And it's your own inoculum and it's probably, sorry, it's probably better than many things you can get on the shelf. <laughs> it really is. I mean, you're, you're getting, it's active and right there, ready to go. Yeah. Making eyeballs like your indoor grow room? Off last year's beds? Yeah. Or yeah, or you can. It, did it go well? No, I'm asking you. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying, oh, last did last year go well? Do I want to perpetuate those things forward? That matters. Um, yeah, you can. Definitely. You can do all of it. I mean, you can play with these concepts and benefit from them. Um, but just take this from my words. If you kind of just trust me, diversity is the goal. Maximize your diversity. Even if you're indoor, grow, maximize your diversity. It's how nature works. It's in highly diverse environments. Yeah. You got to you you end up with time. I'm just curious how you get 9,000 pounds of IMO. How do you, you go out in the woods and you collect a bit? You know, so I made... How do you culture it to that? I made 90,000 pounds of IMO 
with a handful of IMO2. So that's what I'm asking. It, the, the, the culture possibilities are pretty endless then. Yeah, you can grow this stuff out. There's a whole process for that. Guys, I appreciate the time you gave me to speak so much. And uh, yeah, your questions are awesome. And feel free to hit me up whenever.